Welcome to Strip Cover where we squeeze the bigger picture of literature. I'm Adrian Fort. And I'm Dalton Gentry. And we're here for Variety Hour. Not so much. Adrian reads Harry Potter, your favorite segment of the week, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, chapter 13 and 14. How do you feel about that? Did you make sure you got a squirt on the camera? Sure, absolutely. Did Let's you go make with sure that. We're focused? Yeah, absolutely. Did oh. you drive down to Kansas City safely? Are you looking for any kind of excuse not to talk about yeah, Harry Potter right now? Yeah, there's nothing going on here. I hate to admit it, but you might be right this week. This may be the five-minute episode of Adrian Reads Harry Potter because there's not a lot going on. I've got a couple quotes. i got a few things I can talk about, okay. but wow, not a lot. Let's break them down a little bit. Chapter 13, we have the Muggle-Born Registration Commission. Uh, under disguise, Harry sneaks into Umbridge's office. Uh, he doesn't find a locket, but he does find Mad-Eye Moody's eye, which is a little bizarre, yeah. a little weird. Uh, and we have another new minister. We get to meet Pius... Uh, Thickness, I believe it is. I can't. Thickness. Thickness. You can go with thickness. Uh, I, I, there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I know where that's from. A couple websites that I used to. Have. <laughs> uh, we also get to see a uh, Muggleborn trial uh, where oh Harry just goes in and he heroes everything and they all escape with the locket. It's just perfect and no questions are asked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was. Yeah, it was bad. Yeah. It was bad. Uh, chapter 14, The Thief. Uh, the House of Black is no longer safe. Uh, Ron can't apparate. We get to see our first splinch. Uh, it's talked about a little bit, but I don't think we actually ever see a very severe one as opposed to this. Uh, and the kids don't know what to do with the locket. We get a vision from Voldemort. Uh, he's found Gregorovich, the German wand maker, uh, uh, torturing him as well. Then we get a weird vision from Gregorovich, uh, where we see a blonde-haired kid kind of sneaking around. Hits him with a stunning spell. Yeah. We find out the uh, the wand maker's been killed by Voldemort. It's like Peter Pan. And that's it. Sneaking around the windows. That is it. I have no idea what to go with with this week. Peter Pan or um, an adolescent Dalton. Didn't you used to sneak around windows? Let's say, actually, no. I never went through the windows. Oh, okay. Like, my father was just like, eh, just go out the front door. Just make sure you shut it on the way out. That's not what I was talking about. I don't know. <laughs> We're fine. Anyway, uh, anything you want to talk about? How do you feel about this? Where are we going from here, well, Adrian? I've got a real good quote here I'd just like to share. You can hear the disdain in your voice right now. He's fainted, said Hermione, who was also rather pale. She no longer looked like Mafalda, though her hair was still gray in places. Unstopper it for me, Harry. My hands are shaking. Go on. Oh, I just, I, I love to see a strong female character represented in young adult literature. And throughout these moments, in this book at least, um, Hermione's a hot mess. Okay. Hermione is no longer composed under pressure. Okay. Very different Hermione than we're used to. Very different Hermione than we're introduced to in this series. Wasn't it uh, Eleanor Roosevelt who said something like, women are like tea bags, you don't know how strong they are until you put them in boiling water? Okay. In the boiling water, Hermione is not quite uh, up to snuff. She's a weak green tea. Yeah. She is not an Earl Grey anymore. I don't like Earl Grey. Do you I, like Earl Grey? I like tea in general. Those are your tea references for the week, brought to you by Strip Cover Lit. We should Amy, just I hope you enjoyed that. talk about tea the rest of the day. Okay, I understand where you're getting at from there. Uh, so perhaps character development as well, though. Maybe Hermione's not as strong as we've been led to believe. Uh, Good to know, as uh, shit's literally hitting the fan at this point. Yeah. Literal uh, shit and literal fan. Literal both. Anyway, do you have another quote you want to get at here? On the same page, there are spells that would put him completely right, but I daren't try in case I do them wrong and cause more damage. The second episode in a row, correct, that we had daren't? Daren't. Through, I don't know, approximately 3,000 pages of the series, there's been not a single daren't. I like to imagine at this point in time, J.K. Rowling was just like scrolling through like Google or something. And it was like, word of the day, Darren. And she's like, huh. I kind of like, like that one. Huh. Darren. I think I'll add that in here. Uh, we do get some uh, literary references here. Did you catch that? A little uh, allusion towards a famous piece of fantasy literature. Uh, what was it? Talking about that locket. Uh, what, what was the issue with the locket once they got it? Uh, they don't know what to do with it. They know they have to destroy it. But for some reason... That magical object of power is calling to them. It just seems the Lord of the dark. And, and now they must bear that burden. And they're going to have to, you know, go on in their journey and their way to find out how to destroy the ring. 
And yeah. uh, Frodo is just, I, I don't know how he's going to handle it here. So obviously, uh, we're just stealing from Tolkien at this point. Well, and it would be nice to bag on J.K. Rowling for that, but especially, it seems, with the fantasy genre, um, that's sort of the thing to do. Am, am I wrong about that? Like, no. A lot no. of fantasy is built on tropes built from other fantasy. And maybe it is just a trope of fantasy literature, and maybe I'm just salty at this point because you've ruined Harry Potter for me. Uh, but I don't know. It, it seems just almost 100% cut and dry because now we have a piece of jewelry that is obviously cursed with dark magic that the hero must bear on his journey with his friend. And it's going to take its toll on them. Yeah, and this is this is the last book. Yeah. So it's like she was searching for something to do. Yeah, so like, when in doubt, Tolkien. I actually find that <clears throat> that works in a lot of things. Linguistics as well. When in doubt, Tolkien. Yeah. Yeah, he, he did it right. You can't do it better. Yeah. So, do have that going on there. I was kind of hoping you might have picked wind of that. Uh, I do think there are a few other things we could talk about here. Um, if I could, If I could do these things real quick. Sure. And this this happens a lot through these two chapters, at least. But I'm just going to point out these uh, these instances. On 273, apparently he didn't want it back. His lumbago's so bad, said Hermione, now performing complicated figure of eight movements with her hand. Performing complicated figure of eight movements with her hand. So Ron's dad said I could borrow it. Erecto, she added pointing her wand at the misshapen canvas, which in one fluid motion rose into the air and settled fully constructed onto the ground before Harry, out of whose startled hands a tent peg sword to land with a final thud at the end of a guy rope. Hmm. Freud. Ah. The very next line, cave in M I come. Hermione finished with a skyward flourish. Freud. Okay. How do you say that word? Uh, Inimicum? Right, but what does it say? In. I'm. I'm. I. I. Come. Come. Hermione finished with a skyward flourish. What's the first word there? Cave. Freud. 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 Uh, we should just sit down and, like, I think at this point we just need to have, like, Freud's analysis of Harry Potter. Uh, it's really Walt Whitman at this point. Yeah. Let me tell you, fields of penises. Yeah. Fields Everywhere. of penises. Um, On 276, sudden awareness, of what, sudden awareness of what he was holding, of what he lived behind, of what lived behind the little golden doors, hit Harry as he spoke. Even after all their efforts to find it, he felt a violent urge to fling the locket from him. Mastering himself again, he tried to prise the locket, uh, prize the locket apart with his fingers, and attempted the charm Hermione had used to open Regulus's bedroom door. Freud. Freud all over the place. Freud this. all over the place. I, I'm just all pointing the out place. the egregious ones, but okay. Uh, but again, I, I do think we could analyze a lot of this from a uh, Freudian standpoint, and we could just have a heyday with it, especially this book. It seems like there's a lot going on with phallic symbols throughout this, especially yeah. the wand making, all that. We've, we've talked a lot about wands recently. Which uh, brings us back... Um, oh, here we are again. Ironically, to... Uh, what was the book you were talking about earlier? That we read? Uh, Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Which was a, a, giant, a giant sexual metaphor. Okay. If we could return to that argument. Okay. Which sparked some debate on the book tube. So, uh, dare, daren't you say, Adrian... Uh, fantasy literature, just one big sexual metaphor. Oh, I daren't. You daren't? I daren't say that. Okay, okay. We get so many comments recently of like, oh, Adrian's just reading too far into it again. He's just putting things where he wants. <laughs> Freud. Freud. <laughs> so, it's in the text. Read along with us. Tell us we're wrong. We like to hear that we're wrong. Sometimes. Anyway, uh, let's, uh, before we move into another point that I'd like to make about this, let's get a little speculation going, because everybody loves a little Adrian speculation. Uh, how do you feel about Umbridge being in possession of Mad-Eye Moody's eye? I'm not sure how I'm supposed to feel. Is there something that's supposedly weird about that? She is in league with Moldavort. Okay, uh, obviously in league at this point in time. Muggle-hating, she's the head of the commission. She's uh, excelling in this new Voldemort-style government. 
Uh, I, I just, I find it incredibly bizarre that she would take the eye as a trophy, basically, and kind of stick it up to the door there. Well, I don't think it's a trophy. Don't think She's so? She's using it to spy on people. She is, but uh, what... It's a trophy, let's be honest. You could use a lot of devices to spy upon people. There would be a lot that would be at her disposal. Uh, but at this point, she is using a very, very powerful wizard's uh, body part, really. Uh, and he's using it as a trophy. So obviously saying, hey, look what we did. We sort of like a head on a pike. A head on a pike, really. Yeah, uh, yeah that's a good uh, thing there. So just didn't know if you had any uh, feelings about that, where that might be taking us. I wonder if there is some essence to Moody still within the eye. Okay, okay. Uh, but that's the only thing I wondered because it did eventually. Did, isn't that how uh, the fella knew they were in his office, in her office? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, the, the eye has eye. gifts and powers, a yeah. uh, device, basically a magical device, uh, much like you would have in fantasy literature trope again. Uh, so th- there's a little bit going on there. We'll see if that maybe comes back into play. Just wanted to uh, pique your interest with that. Uh, again, we get a little bit of talk about wands. So wands, again, coming into the uh, forefront here as being important throughout this book. So hopefully we're going to get to the bottom of that sometime soon. Uh, any speculation about this, uh, the thief, the, uh, the young Peter Pan, uh, who stuns Grigorovich? Any idea? I'm assuming it's somebody completely unique to this book, because that is sort of the way that these books have gone so far. Um, one has to wonder with the hair if this individual is related to... Um... Malfoy's, perhaps? No, I wasn't thinking the Malfoy's. I was thinking, uh, which probably the Malfoy's now that you say it, because you have it inside. Ah, I can't think of anybody. Uh, the Godfather. Sirius? Sirius. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Did Sirius have the tuft of blonde hair? I don't believe Anytime so. I think of Sirius, I, I think of, uh, Carrie Elwes from Princess Bride. Okay. I don't know why, but that's Sirius in my mind. That's weird. Uh, well, we did get the introduction of uh, Regulus Black into this here. It was just like, well, we're just going to throw this in here to make it work. So maybe this is just Legolas Black, since we're stealing from Lord of the Rings at this point in time. Maybe. Just coming into, uh, you know, sneaking the windows. Got and the blonde hair. Got the blonde hair. It fits. Yeah. Uh, we'll see where we're going with that. Uh, let's get into another point here. We get a lovely scene with Mr. Weasley. Uh, where we find out that uh, because of Mr. Weasley's association with Harry, uh, he's considered a prime target. Yeah. Uh, closest to our number one target, Harry Potter. I feel like if we're talking a lot of our uh, government and war analogies here, with this being World War I, World War II, I, I feel like we get a little bit of McCarthyism here. Uh, where at this point, because of your association with someone, uh, we're going to peg you. We're going to come after you uh, in a governmental sense. Like, you're still going to come to work, you're still going to do your job, but we're going to grill you. And we're going to make it hard for you. Yeah, pegging does make it hard for many people. Thank you. Thank you. Uh-huh. Freud. <laughs> you Freud. those out there, not me. I just captured them. Um, so I don't know what line this is playing. Obviously, the government's being run by Moldavort. Okay. No one really has any illusions that it is not. Moldavort is more than willing to kill. Moldavort is more than willing to kill without reason. We certainly have reason to kill uh, the weasel father. I don't understand how he's still alive, let alone having his job. Okay. Uh, I think that uh, it's decently done by J.K. Rowling's standpoint. I I think that's very much... Yeah, uh, I I, I don't want to cut you off, but I'm not saying it's poorly done per se. I don't understand it as a literary device. Okay. Because what you're doing... who, Who is this written for? Children. So for children, that becomes immediately soft. Okay. For adults, it becomes more embroiled, sure. But a child reading this... So, so this is all written for adults. Think so? Because a child is going to see that and not understand what's going on. Because okay. the child, okay. through the child's eyes, thickness is just Moldavort's right-hand man at this point, right? You, you have to assume that. Mm-hmm. Um, because... Children see things more along the good-bad lines. Um, It's not until a little bit later that the gray areas become more interesting to us. But through those black and white prisms, thickness, allowing the weasel father to keep coming to work, seems like just being soft. Okay. 
I think it adds a little bit to the uh, realism to all of this. If we're going with the uh, theory that this is more written towards adult, for adults right. at this point in time, uh, in the event of a tyrannical government who's basically just overthrown and they've taken power, uh, yeah, they're just not going to kill the guy who they want information from. No, still come to work. Still do your job. That seems realistic to me. Uh, if my company was corrupt and overthrown, I wouldn't assume they would just come after me because I'm doing the right thing. They're going to be like, nah, just keep coming to work. Keep doing your job. Right. You're right where we want you. But you're not doing the right thing. So they also have Azkaban. Okay. They could obviously throw him in there saying that he was a muggle supporter or he was smuggling muggles. And he we are... A, sm a muggle smuggler. A muggle, muggle smuggler? Yeah. And we are seeing that a lot. Uh, a lot of these uh, muggle-born uh, witches and wizards are being sentenced, basically, yeah. to prison uh, for their heritage, uh, which is uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, very uncomfortable, especially in a uh, book that has a lot of World War II themes. Uh, a lot of things going on with that I think we could discuss, but we don't need to. Pretty cut and dry. Yeah. Uh, where else would you like? Anything else you'd like to talk about with this? Um, on 278, from time to time, Harry thought, or perhaps imagined, that he could feel the tiny heartbeat tickling irregularly alongside his own. Uh, Harry Potter as a horror crux confirmed. Think so? Yeah. Okay. And I what page is that? That is 278. We're going to put that up on the uh, the imaginary Adrian board of predictions. Yeah. Page 278, Harry Potter as a horror crux. Yeah. Okay. Uh, In fairness, I called it last book. Okay. Uh, and hmm, I don't think it's fair to ask uh, other horcruxes at this point anything we could speculate because uh, it could be genuinely anything. Uh, we're pretty confident about the locket at this point that uh, Umbridge was in possession of. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's a scar. If you're, are you, do you mean with Harry Potter? What's the horcrux about him? I think it's the scar. Well, establishing the, you know, saying that, you know, Harry Potter might be the Horcrux. Oh, Horcrux. Uh, what else would there be? Because there's still a number of others that we need to uh, get oh, to. Oh, right, here. right, right, right. And how far are we? What page are we into this? We're about 300 pages into... 300 pages into... page book. Is it eight? And a 750 page book. Uh, and we've got a lot of Horcruxes to go here. Yeah. We got a lot of work to do. Uh, which is a little so concerning. Either someone's out there just slinging them around, yeah. or that little thief fella has a couple. Okay. You know, Harry Potter just walks into the retail store and sees the clearance bin on Horcruxes. He's like, oh, well, there they all are. We can get them taken care of at this Regulus, point. Regulus, <laughs> Regulus, Sirius. Oh, here's a Moldavort. Yeah, it's all fine. Yeah. It's fine. Uh, I we, collect Moldavorts. <laughs> we do get a return to Umbridge in this chapter here. And again, Umbridge is being billed as just uh, the big bad. Uh, the big government bad, if you will. Uh, she is definitely thriving in this system. She is definitely enjoying what she's doing, sen sentencing all these muggles to prison. Uh, so it, we really, again, see uh, her in a bad light. Uh, it seems like every time we see Umbridge, she's just doing the unthinkable, and she always just kind of weasels by with it, always gets away with it. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. Anytime you use the phrase weasel, we've got to have some t type of ambiguation. Okay. Disambiguation go on okay. because of the weasels in the text. But too many weasels. Um, oh shit! I had a point there. What were you talking about? Talking about Umbridge. Every time we see her introduced, you know, she's just oh, the worst. The uh, the um, the scene where she steps onto the elevator and singles out Hermione. Was that to go back to the same word ambiguous for you? It, in the text, I think the narrator refers to she said to Hermione, blank, something about Muggles. So, like, at that moment, I thought that she saw her as Hermione. And I was okay. like, what is going on here? Uh, no, no, it wasn't, it didn't read that way to me. Uh, but then again, I, I was pretty aware of what's going on with this right. situation here. Uh, but as a first read-through, that would be a little bizarre, especially, you know, I'm just seeing Hermione and be like, oh, how are you? How about them muggles? Yeah. Uh, so, I wish I... No, she says something about, I wish I'd marked it, but I didn't. Um, she, she steps onto the elevator and says something about... You're here for muggles. You're here for the muggle registry or something like that. Um, oh, okay, never mind. I, I just looked over it. Ah, Mafalda, said Umbridge, looking at Hermione. Traver sent you, didn't he? Yes, Hermione squeaked. Good. Uh, you'll do perfectly well. And then she goes into the stuff about the, the muggles, I think. Okay. But I, I just blanked out on the Ah, Mafalda part, I guess. Well, you know, first sentence of the chapter. Sometimes you got to blank over those. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Pulled a Dalton. Yeah. It's, it's bizarre, because, like, at this point now, like, I am starting to hate on Harry Potter. I'm like, ah, come on. Are you fucking serious? <laughs> and you're just over there be like, oh, yeah, I read that. I didn't notice it. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. I've just accepted Harry Potter for what it is at this point in time. Yeah. Well, here. Here. What is Harry Potter? 
What is Harry Potter? What is Harry Potter? If someone from, I don't know, what's a smaller country, Mars, comes up to you and says, hey, this uh, Harry Potter stuff is apparently a pretty big deal. Tell me about it. What would you say? Uh, it's a series, a children's series, I'd usually bill it as, uh, about a young man who discovers he's a wizard and goes to wizard school. That's it? Pretty much. That's how you would sell it? Yeah. Would you sell it? Would I sell it? At this point, yes. I, I've always got, I'm going to sell Harry Potter. I don't think you're going to take that away from me. Uh, because at this we'll point, see. again, I still like Harry Potter. I, I just, I, I can agree with you. There's a lot of stuff going on here. Uh, we did get mention of the book in Umbridge's office, uh, the Life and Times, whatever, of Albus Dumbledore. Right. Uh, so obviously, again, Dumbledore's still going to be playing parts in this, what's going on with Dumbledore. Uh, so hopefully we'll get to see a little bit more of that. Uh, I, I think there's a lot that could be talked about if you are interested at some point very soon over on Frame Rate. We're going to have a discussion about the new Crimes of Grindelwald movie. Let's talk about that when we're talking about Dumbledores uh, because mm, yeah. hot mess there. Yeah. Hot mess. Plot Good. holes galore. Good. Anyway, that's just for you. So where are we going from here? Because at this point, we can't return back to the House of Black. We can't return to Hogwarts. We can't get to the Ministry. Uh, we're on our own. We're in the wilderness. And as we know, in literature, wilderness is not a good place to be. Right. The forest is bad. There's going to be an attack of some kind. Okay. Okay. Um, I can't remember much about Lord of the Rings. I remember they traveled through the woods, right? Quite often. That last, that last time they went through the woods, there were all those knights on horseback that... Um, the wily fella got him out of it, right? Okay. The the one who is wise in the ways of the woods. I like that. Wise in the ways of the woods. He got him out of that, right? Uh, Bombadil? Tom Bombadil? No, 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 no. Um, oh. The, the real tough fella. Okay. I, oh, God. Whatever his name is. Oh, shit. <laughs> oh. We're in a bad place today. Yeah, it's it's a hot mess. I just, all I can think of is Game of Thrones characters right now. Yeah, I'm not gonna help you with anyway, that. He, anyway, he anyway he confronted all those knights, right? Isn't that what happened there? Yes. Um, I wonder if there's going to be something like that. Okay. Coming soon. So maybe one of our characters really stepping up, uh, taking one for the team, and uh, confronting the big bad. Or not not necessarily the big bad, but a bunch of knights from the big bad. Okay. Right? Okay. So, Death Eaters at this point? Yeah, Death say? Eaters. Okay. On horseback. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, do you have anything else you want to talk about here? I know there's not a lot to go off of, but there really just isn't a lot going on with these two chapters. I've been done for 23 minutes. Very fair. Very fair. So, we will be back next week. Two more chapters of Adrian Reed's Harry Potter, 15 and 16. We have The Goblin's Revenge and Godric's Hollow. So, it sounds like we're finally going to get a little information about this uh, Godric's Hollow. Maybe we'll get a visit because we needed somewhere else to go. And as we know J.K. Rowling... We gotta go somewhere, so let's just go to the most obvious place. What is what? If, what do we know about Godric's Hollow so far? What do we know about Godric's Hollow? You tell me. It's not one of the bars on that main strip, is it? That they always go to. No, but I think we should open a bar and call it Godric's Hollow. We'd sell out. Is it in the woods? No. 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 Okay. It's the sake. That's Tom Bombadil in this novel. Oh, <laughs> we, got, we got something to go on. If there was a Tom Bombadil in this novel and, like, I've just glazed over it completely after I've read this so many times, I hate myself. Would I then bring you to the dark side? Tom Bombadil is a fascinating character and yeah. a wonderful character. Uh, and he is not in the woods in Harry Potter. I'll tell you that much right now. Okay. And uh, if he was, though, yeah, he may piss me off enough that I might give you a little bit of credit. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Anyway. If you like this kind of thing, we do Adrian Reed's Harry Potter every single week here on Strip Cover Lit. So make sure you hit the subscribe button down below and click the bell as well so you get notifications when we upload our new videos here on Strip Cover Lit, which is pretty much every single day at this point. Uh, it's just, about. just terrible, isn't it? Just terrible. 2019 is going to be just terrible. No, it's not. Absolutely horrible. Booktube will never be the same. And if you want to help us continue to create content like this here on Strip Cover Lit, there's a link, as always, to our Patreon to be found in the description below.
That's the first time I've ever got the fucking closing right. <laughs> feel like I warmed up a little bit. <laughs>